May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be all acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Now, one thing that, that you're going to notice is that unlike previous years where we moved the Feast of Ascension to Ascension Sunday, the reason why we didn't do this is because we actually have uh, now an archdeaconry-wide Ascension service that's going to be at Three Streams Church. Now, not everybody made it. We certainly did, did for reasons that, that many of you already know. I'm not going to, to, to get, get into that. Uh, but uh, but I, ideally, we want to gather together as an archdeaconry wherever we hold the service in order to celebrate the Feast of Ascension on Thursday because it is a significant event. Because not only uh, did you know, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he walked about on the earth with his disciples for 40 days teaching them all things, uh, the, the significance of what the scriptures said about him, namely the Old Testament scriptures, because that's what they had in print back then, the, the entire Old Testament in Greek, known as the, as the, the Septuagint. And of course, uh, further demonstrating his humanity as well as his divinity, eating fish for breakfast with his disciples and all of that. So, so here we are on the first Sunday of, of the, the Ascension, and, and what's uh, pivotal about this is that um, if you look at our, if, if you remember our gospel reading today, it gives us a preview of Pentecost, which we will actually celebrate next Sunday. Our lectionary refers to that day as Whit Sunday, which kicks off the, the season of Pentecost or, or Whitsuntide, which will then lead to Trinity Sunday and then Trinity Tide. So at this point in the text, the church had yet to be born, and the disciples were already told to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that, of course, comes out of, out of our readings from Thursday. At this point, there was a sense of anticipation, as well as maybe a little bit of confusion concerning what comes next. Because if you remember from the reading on Thursday, that when he ascended, they were gazing up into heaven and the angels were saying, why are you staring up there in heaven? Because our Lord Jesus Christ will return in the same way that, that he, he ascended. And uh, they had their marching orders to go to Jerusalem and simply wait. They were simply told to wait. And by the way, being told to wait or knowing that you must wait there's a lesson in that concept as well, and I can almost preach an entire homily just on that concept, especially for, you know, for, for myself, who tends to be a little impatient uh, at times. But, but I've learned patience. If nothing else, ministry has taught me a lot, a lot of patience, and that's a good thing. Taught me a lot about faith and a lot about, a lot about trust. In fact, the, the very fact that, that we're worshiping in this chapel is in and of itself a miracle uh, completely designed by God. Because as we remember, we were supposed to be evicted. At, well, not evicted. That's kind of harsh. We, we were told to move out by the end of January. But here we are. It's May. And we'll likely be here for another five to ten years. Who knows? It's all in the Lord's hands. So, so with that in mind, let's turn to our epistle reading, which is found, found on page 179. And this is out of uh, 1 St. Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 will be our text for today. A very short text, but we can unpack a lot from that. So it begins in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Okay, now the word end, as we see in this passage, comes from the Greek telos, which is a point of time marking the end of a season, the end of the duration of that season. In other words, it actually uh, marked the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, and he ascended at the Father, and when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, that actually marked the beginning of the eschaton, or the last things, or the last days, as we read in Acts chapter 1, immediately following the ascension. And we read in verse 10 of Acts chapter 1, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up 
from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. As I paraphrased by, by way of introduction. So in other words, uh, this is in, you know, to be interpreted as a challenge for watchfulness and to also maintain a lifestyle and a conduct that is above reproach. And that's becoming of all of us who proclaim the name of Christ. That in our thoughts, words, actions, and attitudes, they should be guided by what we read in the plain teaching of Scripture, guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. But in this particular verse, St. Peter appeals to his readers, be self-controlled and keep, uh, maintain sober-mindedness uh, in your prayers. Okay, well, why exactly would he say that? Well, his use of the former verb, uh, sophrone, which sober-minded, keep a cool head, perhaps conveys a hint that they should not get too excited about the proximity of the end or allow it to upset the routine of their lives. And actually, St. Paul had to have some conversations by way of epistle to the church in Thessalonica. They were practically waiting on their root, rooftops. And even now, uh, in this era, we, we have people that are so focused on the end times and on, on the rapture, whenever that, that is going to be, they're, they're so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Meaning, while we are here, we still have work to do for the kingdom. Christ will come again to judge the quick and the dead. That we can be sure of. We don't know the sequence of the, of the events exactly. We don't know when that's going to be. But, but ever since the, the ascension, it's been, been the end times. So that means that we have work to do in ministry to conduct here on earth, which ultimately is bearing fruit that remains in the advancement of Christ's kingdom through the gospel. But notice, too, how the next three verses that immediately follow focus on caring for one another. Well, that's interesting. That's an interesting way to shift gears. Well, why? Why is that exactly? Well, because we are in this together as shipmates. You know, kind of funny considering the conversation we had before, you know, what do we call the restrooms back there? Because John Harlan called that a, a, a latrine. Mike called it a ladies' room. I pointed the men's room. This is like an upended ship. It's the nave, so it would be called the head, right? Well, whatever we want to call it, but, but look up. Look at the ceiling. Well, what does that look like? It looks like an upside-down ship. And that's exactly where they got the term nave from. It's actually a visual. The area where you sit is called the nave, which according to Merriam-Webster's definition, comes from the, the medieval Latin navis, and that simply means ship, <laughs> uh, akin to Old English no wind, which means sailors. So it kind of looks like an upside down ship. But, but, just, but just having that concept in mind or that metaphor in mind as shipmates, we row together, we bail water together, we serve together as we are gifted according to our rate in order to take that, you know, naval uh, uh, metaphor to, to maybe too much of an extreme. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But ultimately, we are here to serve together. We worship together in our liturgy and we care for one another out of a spirit of agape love, which serves as a witness in and of itself uh, to the world around us that we are in fact Christ's disciples. So that leads to verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Earnestly, meaning persevering with the implication that one does not waver in one's display of interest or devotion. It is a sincere expression of love which focuses on the worth and value of the other person. Simply put, it's not about us as individuals, for we are here to serve, and that's how we are to love one another. Love covering a multitude of sins, that's kind of interesting. What exactly does that mean? Well, during the time in which this letter was written, uh, this expression, love covering a multitude of sins, it actually was a proverbial expression in the ancient Near East at that time, which is based on Proverbs 10, 12. In Hebrew, the meaning, when we unpack it fully, is that love, unlike hatred, which stirs up strife, 
It actually conceals and passes over faults in silence. And that's a cross-reference both to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, as well as uh, um, what we read uh, elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, don't remember the, I, I don't remember the reference, but some will actually maybe go for that exegesis, and that's okay. But, but unfortunately, that interpretation could fail to do justice to the urgent eschatological overtones of the verse itself. More likely than this, the writer's point is that at the coming judgment, his readers will receive mercy for their sins, of which uh, he has been constantly reminding them, and we see that all throughout uh, this epistle, chapter 1, chapter 2, as well as chapter 4. Uh, in the meantime, our mutual love for one another does not falter. You know, we, we certainly have good conversations with each other, sometimes hard conversations with, with each other. And any time it, it involves anything that, that, that includes a reproof or a correction, it should always be based on scriptural standards, but always done in love in a way that's constructive, that looks out for the good of the individual to the glory of God. But also, too, along those lines, we show uh, hospitality to one another without grumbling. In the context, when you think about it, I mean, Tracy's staying up at a Hampton Inn property. She said she was going to stay for two nights and want to know if it was okay to rent a hotel. Of course, by all means, you know, you use the points. That's what, what they're, they're there for. But back then, it wasn't as easy as that. You could just pull up an app and then find the nearest uh, name your favorite chain, whether it's Marriott or or Hilton or, or whatever, uh, back then, th this verse referred specifically to lodging and sustenance, food, feeding, lodging, because they didn't have the hotel chains back in the day. It was not always readily available unless you were in a larger city that had inns, and especially in an era when the Christians at the time weren't always welcome because of their missionary efforts and actually face persecution. So even if there was a place available, they weren't always welcome. So this admonition absolutely was to the church. But in our modern context, how, to, how do we actually apply it? Well, let's stretch ourselves maybe a little bit beyond our comfort zones to welcome brothers and sisters into our homes. Now, keep in mind that this version of hospitality means that you welcome, welcome them into your home without worrying about whether you had an opportunity to put the place together or not. Okay, because uh, when, when you're welcoming somebody into your home, it's not the same as worrying about an IG inspection that you're having. No, that, that's not what this is all, all about. And nor is it the same as entertaining like we do at the Cobalt House once a year on Epiphany, uh, which we enjoy doing. It's, it's a tradition. And I enjoyed Deacon Dan and Mike playing their music. It was just a wonderful occurrence. And we look forward to next epiphany, but that's a way down the road. But what this means is welcoming people into your home and into your lives, not only into your home, but into your lives by pra practicing true hospitality without stressing out trying to be like a Martha Stewart. Um, also to include in how you engage in trading, but that, that's another matter. Bad joke. Anyway, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Use whatever gift each of us has received in ministry to serve one another and to serve the Lord. Serving the Lord first and foremost, but also serving one another as responsible stewards of God's manifold grace since each of us has a gift to that end and you can read that catalog of gifts in first corinthians chapter 12 it's there the writer cannot be thinking exclusively either of these specific holy spirit giftings such as speaking in tongues or prophesying etc which attracted a whole lot of attention in the apostolic age uh, or certainly of the distinctive tasks of ministers, but of any capacity or any endowment of gifting, such as gifts of administration or mercy or generosity, fill in the blank, which can be employed for the benefit of the community at all, uh, at large. It takes an entire body, all of the parts of the body to that end. 
And his words in this passage recall uh, what we also read elsewhere in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, where, where St. Paul enumerated the gifts, uh, the charisma, uh, if you will, but not only in prophecy, but also of caring for the needy, teaching, preaching, almsgiving, administration, and acts of mercy. In other words, serving one another out of a spirit of agape love. In verse 11, we read, Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. And of course, it certainly closes in this verse with who and what is most important, and that's to give glory to our Lord. Because this verse begins in 11, uh, with the importance of proclaiming God's word. And the reference to the oracles themselves refers to the Torah received by Moses on Mount Sinai. And the reference is not uh, merely to conversation or discussion generally outside of the bounds of scripture, uh, nor is many commentators also supposed uh, any kind of other ecstatic uh, utterances such as tongues, etc which uh, again, you know, that was a huge interest back in the day, uh, but rather the focus of this passage is more on the routine functions of what we're doing today. You know, the, the hearing of the word, like you, you heard from, from the epistle and the gospel, as well as the preaching of the word and even the teaching of itself. We have all of the revelation that we need right here in the pages of scripture. And it tends to just raise red flags whenever I hear any, anyone speaking of, of any kind of a word from, from the Lord uh, that is outside the bounds of Scripture. You know, or any kind of a, a, of a prediction, if you will, of a future events. Because if that uh, prediction does not hold fast and, and is not fulfilled, then that declares that person to be a false prophet. But really, when we think about it, when we serve, we simply serve by exercising all of our gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit, because our purpose in ministry is to glorify the Lord as we serve with humility in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. David Brainerd said this to the famous Great Awakening congregational preacher Jonathan Edwards and I quote I do not go to heaven to be advanced but to give honor to God it is no matter where I shall be stationed in heaven whether I have a high or low seat there but to live and please and glorify God my heaven is to please God and glorify him and to give all to him and to be wholly devoted to his glory that works. That absolutely should work all of us because that is exactly, that, that should be our focus, not on the rewards that we receive, the crowns that we receive, because any, any crowns that we receive, we cast them at the Lord's feet anyway. We don't serve for our own sake. We serve for Christ's sake and for the sake of others, whether it's in the church, which we must do for one another, but also wherever the Lord places us, whatever divine appointments the Lord schedules us so that we may have every opportunity to present the gospel, to, to share the plan of salvation, of eternal life, sharing our, our testimony and actually calling people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because ultimately that's who we serve. Amen. And I say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.